Hey guys, welcome to The Conversation. This podcast is produced by Capital Community Church, and we are located in Fredericton, New Brunswick, right here in Eastern Canada. And so if you're in the area, we would love the chance to connect with you. And as we say each month, consider this your invitation to come and join us for one of our weekly services. You can check out all the information about our church, service schedules by going to capitalcommunity.ca. We hope to see you soon. But now on to today's episode. The McLeod family, uh, they are in a season of transition. And during this time, we have been fortunate that they have spent a fair amount of time here in Fredericton. And with that, we, of course, had to take advantage of them being here and have our friend Dan McLeod on the podcast. Dan and his wife Haley, they're longtime friends of CCC, and they have served in many different ministry roles over the years, including associate pastor, Dan served as youth president for the Nova Scotia district for a time. And more recently, they were aimers on short-term missions in Latvia. During our conversation, we talked about many different things, including the differences between the North American and European church, Dan's journey back to God after a season away as a young man. Also the importance of walking with God each and every day and much, much more. So thanks once again for tuning in to today's episode. I pray that something that we discussed will strengthen you and be a blessing. Without further delay, enjoy the conversation. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. I want to say thanks for joining the conversation. And in particular, I want to say welcome to my friend, Dan McLeod. He is husband to Haley, father to Carson, Sawyer, and Finn, and we're glad that you're in town today and took the time to sit down with us on the conversation. Why don't you greet our listeners today? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. We love the friendship and the connection God has given us here in Fredericton and at CCC and with all the pastoral staff and my joy to be on the podcast. Well, you're uh, we're still relatively new, so thank you for helping us to launch this. I feel like you're still a part, like you're on the ground floor. So if this gets really big, you're a shareholder. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> um, so I guess we'll just kind of start maybe a little bit light and uh, just kind of banter a little bit about um, somewhat of a, a new passion. Um, I know you travel around and you interact with people and uh, some of those that you have interacted with are really big coffee fans. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in fact, you were just recently in South Dakota with Mark Brown. He was recently just here. He was our inaugural episode. And I know he's just like a a coffee fanatic. Um, you know, so I recently got into the espresso game and I bought a machine by Breville. And uh, when I first started full time here at the church, I guess it's 12 years ago this September, that's when I first started drinking coffee. There's something about, I guess, the um, sometimes the intensity of ministry that caffeine mm-hmm. goes really well with that. Um, but since buying this mach- machine last fall, I've barely touched a Tim's, which mm-hmm. was kind of my go-to. So uh, I don't know if that makes me a part of the coffee aficionado club or not because I pull espresso now. But uh, I-, I wonder, you know, in your opinion, what is the best way to brew coffee and what is the best bean you can buy? I certainly think that gets you in the club. <laughs> I mean, I I wouldn't be what I would call a, a coffee Jedi, like some of those men who are farther down the road. But uh, like you, I used to be a big Tim Hortons guy. And when I got to travel a little bit, I was introduced to the whole world of specialty coffee. And for me, I've been leaning pretty hard that way for about four years. Uh, I had a short season where I also had a Breville espresso machine and in the process of moving a couple of years ago, I had to sell that. And so my predominant brew method uh, from that time until now has been pour over. Uh, but being more on the road this season, I generally brew by an AeroPress, which to me still gives you a very good cup of coffee. I love that it's a small portable setup. Uh, when it comes to a bean, uh, I'm pretty loyal to the beans that come out of Africa. If I if I can pick, I my first option is generally anything from Ethiopia, mm. and then second to that is Kenya. In fact, uh, just two days ago, I picked up a great bag of Kenyan beans here in town at Milltown Roasters. Nice and uh, very very good. Been pleasantly surprised with that. Well, I find I kind of feel like I am a, a defector or a heretic because my father. 
I mean, he is an unofficial spokesperson mm-hmm. for Tim Hortons. Uh, somebody once joked uh, when they were following Raymond Woodward on Twitter, they thought they were following Tim Hortons. It was like the Tim Hortons cup. And anyway, that's a, that's obviously a, a joke, but you know, he's very loyal. So I, I don't know. I've kind of, uh, I've kind of stepped away a little bit. I've really been enjoying, enjoying Milltown as well. And espresso mm-hmm. pulling, it's fun. And uh, one thing I didn't realize is I was buying a hobby, not just a coffee machine. Right. <laughs> so for those that maybe are on the fence, you're, you're getting into it. If, if you buy something like that, absolutely. But anyway, we'll we'll uh, we're di- we're digressing a little bit, so we'll get onto some uh, important questions and some good stuff today. Um, you guys recently were involved in AIM uh, through the United Pentecostal Church, and you were in Latvia mm-hmm. and in Riga, in particular, the city of Riga. Correct? Yes, sir. Um, so I, I would I would be interested to know, and what we'll start with today is what is the difference in your view of uh, between the European Church and uh, and the North American Church um, specifically? That's our context. That's where we've been raised. Um, so contrast the European Church, the North American Church, and I guess we'll culminate the question in in uh, what can we learn from our brothers and sisters around the world? Mm-hmm. One thing, just for clarity's sake. When we talk about the European church, I think there there's even a distinction between Western and Eastern Europe. You know, Latvia would be in what we would call Eastern Europe. Western Europe would be France, Spain, Italy, that region. And so culturally, even between the East and the West in Europe, there's a major difference. Uh, for me, one of the biggest uh, paradigm shifts and unique experiences transitioning out of North America and spending a couple of years in Eastern Europe was what I would call just the simplicity of life in Eastern Europe. Uh, now, keeping in mind that this is the former Soviet Union, a sense of freedom and opportunity for independence and you know financial freedom and success in, in that manner has only existed for 30 years for these people. Mm. And so that lends itself to a very simple way of life. That's not to say that people don't have anything or don't own anything, but their sense of attachment to it is very different than it is in the Western world. And I think the extension of that is they're very, in my experience, family-oriented. It seems like life moves at a slower pace, and they're very intentional about taking in every moment Mm -hmm. where I feel like a lot of Western culture has become very materialistic. We're very fast paced. And in the midst of all these things, we lose that sense of community and what I would call the simplicity of life. So that's strictly the, like the life perspective, but the extension of that, when you start to have exposure in ministry and church work in that area of the world is you realize that Faith is also very simple to them. Mm-hmm. The things of God are also very simple. And much of the of the world or places that we would typically call a third world country, to me, I think it's similar in that sense that because life is so simple, God becomes simple. Faith becomes simple. And this is why you can go into settings like that and you see people typically will receive the Holy Spirit very easily or it seems like miracles happen easier. It's not because God loves them more. It's not because they're better. I really think it's because the simplicity of life allows them to have a a more pure or less distracted pursuit of God. And so, for example, in a North American context, you know, I've been privileged as you are to have friends and connections uh, for young men, especially in youth ministry settings around North America. And I could recall conversations in the past where we would talk about. Uh, events or preachers or sermons. And I observe that a lot of times, and not that this is entirely wrong, but a lot of times our conversation in a Western context or North America, uh, when we're talking about good preaching or good meetings, a lot of times those things are infused with a lot of uh, elements of entertainment Mm -hmm. or a sermon may be remembered because it's catchy title or a unique story. Well, so much of those things do not translate to the context of third world countries or to Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And so in Eastern Europe, it's like, what did you preach on today? Well, I just talked about the love of God and 10 people received the Holy ghost. Yeah. And it's that simplicity that was 
for me, such a paradigm shift and also very refreshing. And uh, I was sharing with someone recently, in fact, that as I'm transitioning back into a North American context, I've really felt the Lord challenge me to not allow the pressure of, of that, if I could say it this way, a lot of times an entertainment-driven culture to rob me of the lessons that, that this, this last season taught me overseas. Wow, that's, that's, uh, that's a very significant uh, thing to touch on and cover. And, and I, I can recognize that even being really only in this context my entire life. Um, you know, I remember talking years ago on a different platform. We uh, did an interview with Brad Thompson. And he, you know, I asked him the question, why does it seem like we hear about a lot of miracles a lot of these sorts of things taking place in places like Guatemala and Africa, sometimes third world countries. And I know that, you know, Europe for the most part, it's not a third world country. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, his answer was that, you know, in their case, yeah, in a similar sense, life is simple. They don't really have a lot of other stuff Mm -hmm. to lean on, to rely on. And so God becomes their source and their anchor and, and that's who they go to. So sometimes as, as, uh, you know, our materialism increases. It, it It's a proportionate relationship to our dependence on God. Mm-hmm. I, you know, so I think that that's, that's powerful. Um, you know, when you were in Latvia and when you were on AIM, you, uh, that was basically, you went over just at the beginning or just before the beginning of the COVID pandemic. So mm-hmm. I know that made AIM unique for you. And COVID was unique for you because you're in a totally new place. Uh, you know, a unique setting for you and your family and you're going to do ministry and it just feels like you're restricted for, for the, at least the, a large part of the beginning portions of your aim season. So I I wonder if you would comment on that. And then I I guess more broadly beyond, um, experiencing COVID in Latvia, um, I wonder what in your view would you say is God's purpose behind the COVID pandemic. I know you've touched on this in a recent sermon here at CCC, and I think it's worth discussing again. Mm -hmm. COVID certainly made it unique for us. Uh, We transitioned in July of 2020. Uh, That's when the window opened for us to be able to move. And we were just coming out of that first three to four month lockdown in the spring of 2020 when COVID had uh, kind of swept through the world. And so when the window opened for us to fly into Latvia, we bought our tickets right away and made them move. And we were very blessed in the in the way that transpired because when we landed in Latvia, even though they had been in lockdown, uh, the numbers were so low that it was virtually non-existent, which was a wonderful thing. It allowed us in, to enjoy the summer. It gave us an opportunity to get settled. But after about 90 days of being there, they announced the first round of restrictions was was targeted toward gatherings. So that affected the assembling of, of churches and similar things. And then 30 days after that, they went into a major uh, seven-month lockdown mm. where everything but grocery stores and pharmacies were closed. There were no gatherings, even privately permitted. So it made for a long winter. It made for a very difficult adjustment. <clears throat> we were fortunate in the sense that uh, because uh, we were there on a a work visa, essentially a religious work visa that allows us to work with the church that, that did allow us, uh, some measure of interaction with other people because we're all technically employed by the church. And so we were able to not gather for services, but able to maintain a working relationship and meet for meetings and things of that sort. Uh, But from a family perspective, it was certainly a very long, challenging seven months. And probably a couple months into that, I felt the Lord begin to deal with me and had a little bit of a, a philosophy or perspective shift uh, when I realized we just have to focus on the positive. And to me, that was, we will probably, as a family, never have an opportunity again for that much, you know, un- uninterrupted, unique time together. Certainly, yes, there are elements of frustration when you can't travel and stores are closed and you're locked down. But the other side of that is it really was a gift, an opportunity for our family to, to spend an extended amount of time together, which uh, required a perspective change to see that. But to me, looking back, I'm very thankful for that because mm-hmm. the truth is we'll probably never get it to that measure again. Right, right. And so that was unique. Now, coming out of that lockdown uh, in May of 21, 
restrictions started to loosen and we were able to start traveling a little bit. And so the first trip we took uh, as a family in May of 21 was to Barcelona to be a minister with the Herods. And then for the remainder of the summer, we were able to travel pretty consistently through several countries uh, through Europe. And then in September, uh, COVID finally hit our house. And so September 21, we all tested positive and that locked us down for about a month of, of, of not being able to travel and recovery. And then coming out of that, was able to take a couple more trips to Ukraine and Kenya before we came back uh, at the end of 2021. Mm-hmm. And so it was certainly unique in that it wasn't uh, it wasn't everything we had anticipated or planned because it just it interrupted the world, including our personal travel plans. And so in the midst of that, uh, we really just shifted our focus to our family and to serving in whatever capacity we could. And the reality was is that did not end up being travel and ministry in the sense of a pulpit, perhaps, mm-hmm. that we had intended. Uh, but there were still many, many great projects we were able to be a part of, uh, veteran missionaries we were able to serve in administrative capacities. I spent a lot of time on Zoom. <laughs> As did hours we all. and hours and <laughs> hours on Zoom, which was cool because even that, the Lord used to facilitate so many great relationships and connections with people all around the world. And and I think even moving forward, uh, though we're moving back towards the, the the freedom of having no restrictions, I do think virtual platforms will continue to be a valuable tool moving forward. Uh, probably not so much for evangelism, but especially in things like leadership development or maintaining those relationships at a leadership level. Yeah. So for me, that was very valuable. And so, yeah, definitely a unique season. Uh, in that regard, but I can look back without a doubt and say, you know what, I think God's purpose in us going was still fulfilled. Uh, there were lessons I learned. There were ideas or concepts I had that were challenged. And I feel like as we're reintroduced into a North America concept, uh, while still maintaining aspects of global involvement, I look back and think, you know, what? I'm very, very grateful for the lessons that season taught me and probably still, still, uh, are learning now because if you look at COVID, uh, to your second question, I've had to repeatedly tell myself through the pandemic that if God wanted this to be gone, it would be gone. Mm-hmm. You know, there's enough people who have prayed against it, who have asked God to remove it. If He wanted to take it away, it would be taken away. Now He has chosen not to. You know, it's still in some measure lingering through the world and. We're still in certain places, in certain ways, seeing elements of, of restrictions linger that remind us of, of this reality. You know, people have lost family and friends. And, and so if God hasn't chosen to remove it, then I go to the my next question is, okay, God, why? What are you doing? I'll never forget years ago, it may have even been here at CCC, that uh, Bishop Jerry Dean preached a message on redemptive lift. Yeah. And the concept was basically that, you know, when, when it's given to God, when God's involved, there's this redemptive lift where he redeems things for his good and he lifts it up. And when I look at COVID, that's kind of my approach now. It's okay, God, you didn't remove it. We've asked, we've asked, you didn't take it away. Where is the redemptive lift here? How are you redeeming this for good? And I think there's so many so many elements uh, that you could look at. One for us personally was the family component. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think in many ways, not just us personally, but many churches, when you lose the ability to gather corporately, even if it's just for a short period of time, what it causes you to do is it really exposes the weakness. Yeah. And for me, speaking very transparently, and I think if churches were going to be honest and families would be honest, it was probably similar for many, many people is that we had become so overly dependent on the corporate gathering in the development and discipleship of families and children that when that element was taken away, it exposed the weakness of the church or the weakness of our homes. Mm -hmm. And so for us personally, that's why I say that lockdown is as so there certainly were elements of frustration. It really was a gift and that it allowed us a, a dedicated season of reevaluation and realignment because ultimately, in my opinion, the, the, the gathering of the church should be a reflection of the homes. Mm. You know, the strength of the church, like the old saying says, 
A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Yeah. So if I could make the comparison, the church is only as strong as the weakest family. And I understand that's not entirely true, but in principle, I think what we're seeing is uh, we're the exposure of the weak point. And in fact, I had just read this in the book of Nehemiah last week and felt the Lord deal with me so strongly about it, is in the rebuilding of the wall, they're instructed to set guard over the exposed places. Mm. And so he's basically telling them, you need to identify the places of this construction where there are, are holes or exposure, where there's opportunity for, for vulnerability, opportunity for attack, and you need to set guard over that. And to me, what COVID did is it, it helped us identify some areas that we are perhaps not as strong as we need to be, first and foremost, in the family unit. Well, you know, we've said it for years, and, and I know it's a common phrase that many people probably say, but strong homes and strong families make strong churches, mm-hmm. without question. And I, I completely agree. Uh, in fact, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in this, but, you know, the persecution of the church in Jerusalem, in and, and you know, the ministry of Stephen, the stoning of Stephen, the wave of persecution that came, it pushed them beyond their, you know, their kind of corporate comfort zone mm-hmm. into isolated places, but that allowed for a new level and a new paradigm and a new, um, you know, a new way to minister. Right. And and the church grew as a result. So it exposed weakness, but hopefully we've learned from it and grown from it. Um, You know, so we've talked about you being on AIM. Of course, uh, that involved a transition in your life. Uh, For context, for those listening, you are from New Brunswick, uh, a town called Woodstock. You attended Bible college here uh, in Fredericton back, whatever you can clarify the years. In, but the, in the old days. In the olden days. Uh, and while you were here, uh, Justin McKenzie, he was the youth pastor for a two-year stint here at CCC, and you were at Bible college around the same time. And um, it's it was Justin's intention to go back to Nova Scotia, his, um, his native land. Mm-hmm to work in the kingdom and, and build a church there. And independent of that, I, I know that God spoke to you and, and directed you to Halifax, and you guys teamed up for about a decade. So that's kind of a, a laying a little bit of a foundation there. But, of course, the day came when you started feeling God to prompt you, uh, that transition was coming, and, of course, that culminated in you guys going on AIM, and now you're entering into a new season again, uh, kind of, of traveling and ministering. So my question is, for those that perhaps feel a transition shift or something in their spirit, an uh, unsettledness in their spirit, what is the best way, the proper way, the proper channels to flow through to navigate that season properly from a kingdom perspective? Mm -hmm. I think two things I would say, reflecting on the steps we took that, that proved helpful and safe for us are move slow and move spiritual. And so our transition, I know there were a lot of people that that saw the announcement of us leaving and and were shocked, but it had really been the culmination of a three-year conversation uh, in our family and with Pastor Jay. It was in the summer of 2016 that the Lord first started dealing with me about that. And for a year, uh, we just prayed about it internally, you know, within our family. It was not a conversation with other people. I had not even approached Pastor Jay. And then it was in the fall of 2017 that he and I had the first conversation about what I was feeling and, and possibly thinking. And even at this point, there was not, I was never looking for an opportunity to leave. There was, I wasn't searching for the exit door. It was just this feeling I was navigating. And I thought, you know what, I can't, I can't navigate this independent of my pastor's voice anymore. Mm -hmm. And so there certainly has to be a season where where you are praying, where you are seeking God, where you are hearing from God. But then there comes a point when you say, okay, I need to to take what the Lord is speaking to me and in the right attitude and with the right uh, submissive heart. I need to go to my leader who I'm accountable to, and I need to begin to have this conversation with him. And so uh, that happened in September of 2017, and there was nothing definitive that came out of that. It wasn't like, okay, I'm leaving now or I'm leaving next year. It was just a conversation about what I'm feeling, uh, the uncertainty of the future. And at that point, it was still another two years before that transition materialized. And so, so move slow. Move slow. Move slow. 
Uh, and I think the danger there sometimes is you can feel things so strongly you think, I have to go now. You know, now's the time. And that's not always the case. Mm. I think sometimes you just feel it strongly because you would never consider it any other way. Mm-hmm. So move slow, absolutely, and move spiritually. You, you have to make it a spiritual matter. For me, the reason I waited one year to talk to Pastor Jay was because, I mean, really, the, the church was trending upward. I mean, we had just moved into a new building. We were seeing breakthrough we had never seen before. And uh, in the midst of that, there were elements of personal challenge. You know, I, I had two, sometimes three jobs outside of the church. I wasn't full-time at the church in that season. Uh, we were renovating the building. Mm-hmm. And so for extended periods of time, you know, I'm working from seven to three at the hotel. I would uh, go home and change and go straight to the church, and we would jump into the renovations. And it was a very hard season. I mean, there was a lot of, of sweat and sacrifice. And I would frequently tell the Lord, God, I don't want to make a move. I do not want to transition out of frustration or discouragement or weariness. And looking back, I don't think I fully grasped this in the moment, but essentially what I was telling God was, I want to make sure this is a spiritual move. Mm-hmm. I don't want to move out of any carnal reaction. And so that that kind of hesitance uh, allowed me to not you know, move too quickly. It allowed me to make sure it was a, a spiritual in nature, which proved very beneficial. And then ultimately, as I said, it was those conversations with Pastor Jay and a couple other elders in my life that, that have uh, for years been voices of consistent godly counsel. And the scripture says, we know it, but in the multitude of counselors, you know, there's safety. Yeah. And so I was very intentional about seeking out the voice of these different counsels, making sure that, you know, they could offer me criticisms and ask questions that I wouldn't think to ask myself. And, and so you need to move uh, slow, move spiritually, and move with counsel. Yeah, and over the course of that time, seeking those voices, uh, obviously in your case, that, that sensation or that feeling, it clarified and I would say probably intensified. And, mm-hmm. and uh, at what point did you really feel like now uh, and a release to, to take a step toward that, uh, how did that kind of materialize the, the latter portion of that season, that slow season? Mm-hmm. Well, in, in early 2019, the Lord began to speak to me about, uh, about the transition and how the time was approaching. And again, we weren't actively looking for opportunities to sure. leave. Like to this day, in fact, you know, last week in South Dakota, they were asking me about the transition, sitting in a restaurant. I broke down crying. Like my heart is still there. I I love Pastor Jay. I love that church. I love that city. And so one statement I've said to kind of summarize this is, is going is easy. I told this to Pastor Jay last summer. I think it was. Going is easy because when the Lord asks you to do something, there's such excitement in following the call of God and doing the will of God that going is easy, but leaving is hard. Mm. And so when God says go, that the excitement of going, I mean, it's that's not the hard part. But when you have to leave, that that's the hard part. Yeah. And uh, for us, it was just such a unique thing. And that that going when we went overseas, that that transition out, uh, that was exciting. But when you have to look at the reality of a decade of investment, and you have to give give that up, you have to walk away from that. That can be a very, very challenging process. Mm, absolutely. Um, speaking of transition, we will probably transition into a, another uh, arena and uh, subject here. Um, but thank you for sharing that. I think that will bring some insight to somebody maybe that's in that same sort of a season. So, uh, you know, you were born and raised in church, um, but there was a season that you were away from God. Um, and certainly not in any effort to glorify that season, but for the benefit of somebody who maybe is in a similar season. They're, maybe they've known God, had a relationship with God, but they're away from God. Or maybe somebody's never had a connection with God, and they just feel so lost and distant and thinking, well, I can, I can never find my way back or find my way to. Um, I wonder if you would share about that season in your life, and specifically 
how God started to reach to you and and how you came back to God um, again for the benefit in particular of somebody who themselves might be away from God right now? Mm-hmm. Well, I was raised in church or around church, and what I mean by that is my parents had always taken us to church, and so everything that that we would see and hear around a Pentecostal church is not was not new to me. I had grown up around it. You know, our worship was familiar, our lifestyle, the teaching. It was all familiar to me, but it was not personal to me. Mm-hmm. There was a short season uh, through my late childhood, early teen years, where we did have a pastor in Woodstock who, uh, he was kind of put in an unfortunate uh, situation, but I feel like, you know, as a kid, you certainly don't see it all, but I look back at that and think, he really made the best of it because he was very invested in young people. And I don't recall any time in my life where I felt like someone had invested so much in me or been as intentional about building relationship with me as he had been. And so it was during that season when I was 12 years old, I was baptized in Jesus name. And, uh, I can remember in that season feeling the Lord really reaching for me. And that's probably the, you know, the first time I can really remember uh, as a child growing up the opportunity or the call for it to really become personal to me. But unfortunately, it was shortly after being baptized uh, when I was 12, not too long after that, uh, he had left and, and moved on to a different direction. And as a result, uh, that personal investment that had uh, yielded such positive influence in my life was gone. And after that, uh, from really 13 right through to 18, uh, you know, were very wayward years in my life. Uh, Ultimately, you know, when I look back, I can pin it down to this. It was never personal to me, which was the fundamental problem. But I was was very easily swayed uh, by the opinions of other people. Mm. I could take you to the, the place I was, the people that were there when I was 14 years old, when I was asked the question, you know, do you do this? And uh, I had never done it. I had never seen it. I had never in my life been in an environment where this kind of stuff existed. But I was afraid to say no, which was the true answer, in fear that these people that were three and four years older than me that let me play basketball with them because of my ability, that they would reject me Mm. if I told them the truth. And so that peer pressure, which wasn't even overt, they weren't with words or action, you know, pushing me. It was simply a question. Right. But it was that subtle peer pressure that I gave into in that moment. And when I did that, now I felt the pressure to maintain this identity, mm. to fit in with this crowd. And that was the single decision that that launched me into uh, five years uh, of waywardness. And on the surface, it looked okay. Uh, you know, people think you're just doing your thing, you know, you're, you're cool, you know, you're accepted by the popular people. And the reality was internally, you know, I was very frustrated. I had a lot of anger in my life, Mm -hmm. uh, very empty. You know, you you look for that sense of fulfillment and self-identity and, and things or activities or relationships and you don't find it. And so, it, it was a very hard season. When I graduated high school in 2006, I had gone to the city of Halifax. Again, at this season, not serving the Lord. Um, the unique thing is, is my aunt and uncle who pastor here in New Brunswick, when I went to Halifax for university, Pastor Justin was a youth pastor in Halifax at that time. Yeah, yeah. And they had connected the two of us by email, uh, thinking that maybe you know he could reach out to me, have a positive influence, get me connected to the church. And We exchanged some emails, and I told him years later, I said, bro, I just had this mental image of what you were like, and I just decided it was probably best best that we didn't meet. (laughs) And uh, so we didn't meet in that short uh, four-month period where I lived in Halifax for my first semester of university, but only God would know that years later we would go back and start a church together, which was so amazing Amazing. But. Uh, I go to Halifax in the fall of 16 for my first year of university. At the time, I thought uh, my dream was to get an arts degree and eventually go to law school. There was a man who had been in my life, was very influential as a teenager, who was a lawyer. 
And so that had a profound influence on me. Uh, but when I tell you I was miserable inside, I was miserable. And uh, there was a lady in the church that I grew up in in Woodstock. Her name was Alice Ellis, a tremendous woman of prayer. And uh, I still have notes that she would write me about things that the Lord was speaking to her. She felt about our future. Uh, I would get home in the middle of the night. I would not be sober. I mean, I'm a very messed up, angry, confused 18-year-old guy. And I could feel God reaching for me. Like I, I would come home in the middle of the night and I'd be, you know, laying in my in my dorm room, knowing I was unhappy, knowing I was messed up, and I could feel like the love of God. As crazy as it sounds, I could feel God's love like reaching for me. And I was so afraid that because uh, I had grown up around church, I was so afraid that this thing called the rapture is going to happen and I'm not going to be ready. And so I would take my cell phone and I would call. Alice Ellis's house. It'd be like three in the morning mm. because there were some people I weren't sure if they would go in the rapture, but I knew she would. And so I would call. And as soon as I would hear her or her husband, Cliff, answer the phone, say hello, I'd hang up because mm. I wasn't to a point of, of vulnerability where I was willing to make that step, but I was looking for that comfort or that relief to know that there was still hope, mm-hmm. you know, that I hadn't missed my opportunity. And so uh, some stuff had transpired at the end of that first semester uh, with the group of people I was hanging out with that really caused me to just stand back and think, okay, these people are way more invested in that lifestyle than I am willing to. Uh, you know, there was some severe crime and, and uh, violence that had happened with some of them, and I was not nearly that connected. But when I saw that happen to people that I was spending time with, it opened my eyes to the reality of where my life was mm. and where it was heading. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, I made the decision over Christmas break, uh, to, uh, transition to, uh, St. Thomas university here in Fredericton, which my best friend from childhood, he was attending there at the time. And so the cool thing was, is I didn't even realize that I was making steps toward God. But if you can imagine the thousands of, of, uh, students and dorm rooms on St. Thomas University. I go into the the registrar's office to do the transition, and I tell them I want to live in a dorm room on campus. And uh, I say, well, I'd like to be in the dorm. I tell them which one. And out of all the vacant dorm rooms at St. Thomas University, the only vacant dorm room they have is in the building I want, and it's directly across the hall from my best friend. Wow. And so to me, I look back and I just think, man, that little things like that are the kindness of God that I don't want to overlook because I didn't realize uh, where I was, but these were steps that he was guiding me on to bring me back. Mm. And so I come to St. Thomas and finish my first year there, uh, still not really pursuing God, but not as mixed up as I had been for the past few years. I'm slowly cutting ties from... Uh, a lot of the the drugs and the alcohol, and uh, you know, I, I started that finishing my first year. Uh, I couldn't join the team, but I was practicing with the St. Thomas basketball team with uh, the desire to be on the team the following year. I was traveling with them, and so the Lord was uh, helping me break free from some of those negative connections. But then, at the conclusion of that first year of university, I had gone home. Again, there were some things that transpired that just caused me to really consider what am I doing with my life? Like, uh, I'm not happy. Mm. Um, And I had gone to our district youth convention here in May. My dad was kind of old school, and their rules are if you you live in my house, you do what we do, and we go to church. So if you're living here, you're going to church. They didn't know that that Friday morning I had just signed a lease on an apartment and that when I came home on Monday— it was my intention to tell them I'm moving out. My friend and I, we have a, a lease in Fredericton. And, but I go to this district youth convention, and that was the year that the power went out in the St. John Convention Center, and they moved the services to the church over on Mark Drive. And I remember the sanctuary in that St. John church on the Saturday night being packed full because yeah. it not built to accommodate this many of course, people. Yeah. And I'm sitting somewhere at the back over on the, on the left side, and, this guy's preaching. He's talking about an extreme makeover. 
talking about guilt and all these different feelings and fear and anger. You can take it off, and God will give you something else to put on. The whole time he's preaching, I'm sitting there thinking, this is my life. Hmm. Like I, I've spent five years. This is this is my life. I, I, I'm projecting all these things. I, I'm showing these faces, but really this is how I feel inside. This This is me. And so when he gives the altar call, people are praying, and I'm just sitting in the back with my head down in the pew, not really praying, just kind of reflecting on, I mean, he, this is me. And I look up, and here's this preacher. I mean, he's climbing over the pews. And he comes down, and he just lays his hands on my shoulder, and a very simple prayer. He says, God, I know this young man has a heart for you. So whatever is holding him back from serving you, I pray you would deliver him of it tonight. Mm. And he turns around and walked away. I mean, very simple prayer. Yeah. So I get back to the hotel room that night, and uh, the person I was in a relationship with at the time sends me a text message. It's about 2 in the morning. It's something to the effect of, you know, we need to break up. This relationship is over. Because of the pain in my life, historically, I would be one to draw a great sense of my self-confidence from a relationship. And so typically, that kind of thing would really mess with me. But when I read that text message, it was like a light bulb went off in my head. Mm. I thought to myself, this is it. This is what he just prayed. Yeah. And, man, something changed in me that night. And I knew, like I said, this had been a process where I could see God had been reaching for me. And I'm coming home in the night, and I'm even though I'm messed up and intoxicated, I feel this overwhelming love of God reaching for me. And I watch how God walked me out of Halifax and walked me out of Fredericton. And now he's walking me out of relationships. And so I made up my mind that night, when I go to church tomorrow morning, my life will be different. Mm -hmm. And so in the middle of his message Sunday morning, uh, I didn't even wait till he was done. I got up out of my seat and went to the altar and just laid on the floor. And when he finished preaching, he came down beside me and sat me up on the edge of the platform, and he's just asking me questions. You know, what's what's going on in your life? What do you need? You know, where are you at? And so standing right there, just to the, the left side of the pulpit in a church in St. John, New Brunswick, on that Sunday morning of District Youth Convention, he prayed me through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. And when I, when I say it was a life-changing experience, like, it truly was life-changing. Wow. I mean, it changed the the direction of my life. It changed my circle of friends. It changed my, my interests, my heart, like it changed my life. Mm. And so I've never looked back. I mean, I can, everything I'm doing now is a result of a decision that I made that day. Well, I was going to say, you know, looking back, you can certainly see the drawing of God. Mm -hmm. And of course God does that whether somebody has been in the church before or not, no man can come to the father except that spirit draw him, draw him. But also, it's the power of a made-up mind. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a point of decision, and and that's powerful. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'll, I will just throw in also as a uh, currently as youth president in the district where that youth convention was held. You know, I think that is a good reminder even for me today. You know, the power of those moments mm -hmm. in the presence of God. It is worth it. You know, all the effort. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, whether it's a convention or or a Sunday service. There's those those opportunities to have a moment with God, and so we need to make sure. You know, if you're listening today, and uh, man, I encourage you come come and be a part of a service, come and be a part of of what God is doing and be in His presence. Mm -hmm. It can make the difference. Um, we're going to ask a couple more questions, and we'll kind of start landing this plane. Um, you know, you are currently in Canada. You're transitioning. Uh, to more of a, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but you're going to be doing more traveling and ministering, and, and of course you'll be basing out of a uh, church, so there will kind of be both elements there, a local involvement and a travel um, ministry involvement. Mm -hmm. It's probably a, a bad way to say it, but anyway. Um, as you travel around, uh, I am interested to know in this season what God has been dealing with you about what God has been laying on your heart, and what do you find that you are coming back around to repeatedly, perhaps, as you minister, as you preach? Uh, what are some of the, um, I suppose, the highlights or the major themes that God has been putting, putting in your heart to deliver to the body? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, there's a few different things. Uh, one of the main ones that I seem to, the Lord is continually redirecting me to as of late, it sounds simple, is but just the necessity of having a relationship with the Lord, mm-hmm. um, of actually walking with God. And so if you look at Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord moved. And you hear this kind of expression or terminology uh, in our church services a lot. God is moving here. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is here. You know, you, We can feel God moving in our lives. And that really... We find other places, but the first mention of that is is Genesis chapter 1. But the first time God ever moves in the context of a human relationship or with humanity, it's in Genesis 3. Mm -hmm. The Bible says they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. And so in Genesis 1, God is moving, but there's no humanity. In Genesis 3, there is humanity, and the movement of God is personified as he, he is walking. Yeah. And this is something that, uh, you know, and really all of my ministry when it comes to what I'm preaching, it, it really is an outflow of, of what God is speaking to me or what God is teaching me or things I have learned that help me and now I want to help others. Uh, but it really just comes back to that. God is looking for somebody to walk with him. And going back to the earlier comments about you know, the, the entertainment culture, in America, that can sometimes, uh, you know, influence uh, elements of our our pursuit of God or our church culture. They're not bad in and of themselves, but nothing su- is a substitute for actually walking with God. Yeah, and it sounds so simple, and I think it's that simplicity that allows it to be so easily overlooked. God is just looking for somebody to walk with Him, and I think many times. Uh, I told somebody recently, uh, I said, if, if, you want, if you want a feeling that will change your life, ask God to let you feel how lonely he is when he wants to talk and you don't want to listen. Wow. Because I think a lot of times we, we approach God with this idea that, that he's Lord, you know, he's this majestic king, which is true. I'm not minimizing that at all. But there is this intimacy of fellowship when you when you discover the fatherhood of God, mm. and there's this element of friendship and fellowship with God, where I think sometimes God just wants to walk and talk to you, just like you know a man pursuing a relationship with a wife or two friends building a great friendship where you learn what each other likes and don't like. When you just walk with God, there's going to be things he starts speaking to you about, and you're going to learn, oh, God doesn't like that. God, God doesn't like when I respond to people with this harshness or with this attitude. And Because what happens, I fear, sometimes is we, our relationship with God becomes so contingent on Scripture and verse. And I'm not minimizing the Bible at all, but it's like, well, can you give me Scripture and verse for that? Well, I shouldn't necessarily have to give you scripture and verse for everything. To me, that self-defense mechanism is indicative of like a, a relationship malfunction because there's certain things that, and I'm not, if there's scripture and verse, there's nothing we can do to, to justify breaking that. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the law of God. What I am saying is I think there's a, a place of relationship beyond that, beyond the scripture and verse where in, in, in fellowship with God, in walking with God, the Lord just begins to deal with you as a person. Yeah. Because that scripture and verse, that's applicable to you, to me. It's applicable to Canadians, to Americans, to Latvians. It doesn't matter the culture or the context. That scripture and verse is applicable. Well, and, and I heard somebody say one time uh, that God does still speak to us beyond his word it will never contradict his word well said but it he can still speak to us and lead us into a specific conviction a specific calling because of course you know the reality is we can't open the bible and you know hey god should i go to this university or not should i marry this person or not there's obviously times and places where god needs to speak specifically to us beyond his word Mm -hmm. not in contradiction to his word but anyway to our spirit specifically yeah absolutely and so to me, just the, the beautiful uh, simplicity of actually walking with God 
And why did God come to the garden? Because he wanted to walk with Adam and Eve. He wanted to talk with them. Yeah. And if we will just walk with God, God has things to say to us. He may tell us that our waitress at the restaurant is suffering a, a marriage that's falling apart. And he may give you a word to minister to her. He may put the love in your spirit. It may not be a specific word, but he may put an overwhelming love in your spirit that you could bring strength to her in that moment. Mm -hmm. your kindness to her or what she senses from you. It could be, uh, you know, Bishop John Min, he personified this so well. And I look back and I think, man, this is a, this is an elder who, who has walked with God. And I asked him one time, I said, Bishop, how was this cultivated in your life? And he just began to tell us how he had a praying mother and his mother could hear from God and his brother had been off at war. They hadn't heard from him in, in several months, I believe. And uh, she's praying one day, and she says, Boys, I want you to get dressed. We're going to the train station. And Bishop, who's just a boy at the time, says, Well, Mom, why are we going to the train station today? She said, Your brother's coming home from war. Hmm. He said, We got dressed and went to the train station, I think up near Heartland, New Brunswick at the time. And he said, Sure enough, who was the first person off that train? My older brother. Powerful. And that's what I mean. You think, well, why would God tell you that? Is that really is that really necessary information for the salvation of somebody or, or for the deliverance of people? No. But as a friend, mm -hmm. there are things God will tell us yeah. if we'll just walk with him. That's what friendship is. Friendship is the ability to just enjoy fellowship, if I could say it this way, without purpose. Mm. You know, we're not meeting to accomplish a specific task. We're meeting because we enjoy the company of one another. I feel, like, uh, be honest, as I talk about it, I, I feel like the excitement of the Holy Ghost in me because I think, for me personally, I know this is where God is trying to take me to. Yeah. And I feel the outflow of that challenge to the body is that we're very accustomed to, if I could say this, a works-based relationship. Serve God to do this or in serving God, you know, here's things you need to do, which again, I'm not minimizing uh, or, or advocating we remove those elements where the scripture gives us clear instruction or admonishment. What I am saying is there's a dimension beyond that mm -hmm. where you can discover this beautiful, intimate fellowship with God where where he speaks to you and guides you and talks to you. Uh, he may tell you your son's getting off the train on Friday who you've not heard from months. Why? Because you're friends. Because you're friends. And so to me, just that, it's so much of what I feel God's saying in this season is coming back to the the simplicity, but the power of a relationship with God, of walking with God. Uh, that's, I mean, in the natural sense, it's so much of what he, he challenges people to do. You know, Enoch walked with God, Noah walked with God, Abraham walked with God. The children of Israel had to walk to get out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. They had to walk to get into the promised land. They had to walk to conquer Jericho. So all of this is like a like a picture to us. God could have chosen to allow those things to happen without the emphasis on the walk. But I think he's taken us back to what was first shown in Genesis chapter 3 and through the entirety of the story of Scripture, even in the ministry of Jesus Christ. You know, the question is asked in uh, John 1, I believe it is, well, you know, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Asking about Jesus. And Philip repeats the same thing Jesus had just said moments prior, come and see. Right. So what he's saying is there's some things you don't you don't learn unless you actually live this. Yeah. You can hear other people say it, you can watch a YouTube video, you can read the bestseller on Amazon, but there there's a dimension of knowing God that you only discover if you come and see. You have to get up from where you are, you have to walk with us. Mm -hmm. And in living it, you will learn it. Yeah, I, I love what you said, you know, and I think it's true that sometimes we approach God from like a works-based relationship in the sense that, you know, I'm praying, you know, sometimes as a a one of the pastors here, you're praying, God, help me to have a word for this particular service, or there's a need in the church or in my life, God, I'm praying that you would do this. And so we approach God, you know, uh, and it's not that we can't or shouldn't ask for those things, right. but, you know like a vending machine maybe, as opposed to, you know, having a relationship without a 
purpose or having communion and fellowship with God without a particular purpose. It's mm-hmm. just for the sake of being in his presence. I'm probably going to, well, I know I'm going to butcher the story and the details. I just remember the punchline. I think it may have been Mark Morgan that told the story about an older lady. Yeah, Marilyn uh, Chanel. Okay, maybe you could tell it better, but was it her husband passed away and she was lonely? No, she when she got married to her husband, uh, they lived out kind of in the middle of nowhere. And her husband would be, was a farmer, so he'd be up at That's the crack of dawn and not back until the evening. And she was at her uh, sink washing dishes one day, and she's just telling the Lord, you know, Lord, I, I'm so happy to be married to my husband and working in the ministry, but he's gone all day. I'm, I'm so lonely. And she makes the statement, I just wish that you would send me a friend. And as soon as she made that statement, she heard the patio door open and footsteps coming down the hallway. And so she turns around, presuming you know it's her husband, but she sees nobody. But she's watching, she hears these footsteps, and the chair at the kitchen table gets pulled back, and the indent comes in the cushion as if someone sat down. And she heard the voice of God speak to her and say, am I not enough? Yeah. And, uh, and I've heard some people say it like, you know, sometimes I get lonely too. Yeah. I don't know if that's somebody just inserting that, but but to your earlier point, like help us to feel... You know, because we God is not just some deity; He's also a Father. It's relational. Mm-hmm. So help us to feel the loneliness that sometimes He feels in in our in the void between us. Yeah. Right? Powerful, powerful stuff. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think if we can ever, uh, if we can ever feel, and I have asked God to let me feel it. That's why I think it's such a, a challenge and draw my personal life right now. But if we can ever ask God to let us feel uh, his loneliness, because I'll, I'll be honest with you, I can look back over my life, even as a minister, as a district youth president, and as, a, as an associate pastor, and as you just said very well, I can identify a lot of seasons where my prayer, which is what I would call my relationship with God, was really contingent upon my service. So I'm praying because I want a word for Sunday. I'm praying because this problem in the church. I'm praying because of this. I'm not advocating we don't pray about those things, but above all, mm. I'm praying because my relationship with God. Same as a preacher, I'm not preaching, and this is a, a major paradigm shift that my personal uh, preaching and study habits have evolved in the past few years. I used to study to preach, like I, I, I really did. I would. You know, I would have my daily devotion. I'll read my Bible. But in terms of study, I would just study for my message. And really now, I mean, there's probably hardly a day that goes by that I'm not just studying something. I mean, in my pen and paper, I've got notebooks. If I'm not at a desk with my stuff, I've got notes in my phone. But I, I've really tried to create a lifestyle of study. And so when it comes time to prepare an actual message, uh, it's... It's a very different process than it was several years ago. It used to be, okay, I'm preaching this Sunday. I need to pray about this, get a thought. It's going to take me you know, 10, 12 hours. You know, I'm going to craft this time out. Well, now it's this continual life of study, themes or concepts God is speaking to me about. And when it comes time to preach, uh, it typically is just a matter of you know, two, three, four hours of you know, pulling what I've been studying for weeks Mm -hmm. together and kind of eliminating the unnecessary and and figuring out where I want to focus. But I'm not studying just to preach. This is the change. I'm studying to know God. Mm. When I go to the scripture, ultimately, I'm not just putting something together to get up and say on Sunday. I want to discover God in the pages of the Bible. In, In the process of study, I want to meet God there. I don't want to just this to be a, you know, a thought I throw together to give to somebody on a weekend. I want to meet God in study. I'm studying to know God. So God, as much as God is walking with me in prayer, God is walking with me in study. Mm-hmm. And so I think just that, like I said, the simplicity, but the power and, and the beauty of, of that relationship with God. And I think the extension of that. This is another thing I, I've hit lately that has been so strong in my spirit is the necessity of healthy interpersonal relationships. I don't think, I think one of the biggest obstacles to church growth 
uh, our biggest hindrance. It's not, it's not that we're not praying enough. It's not that we're not fasting. It's not that we're not having good church. I think in many cases, it's we simply, we don't have healthy community. Mm. We don't have pure godly relationships. And uh, I, there's several places you could look to scripture from this. For me, God started dealing with me from the story of Cain and Abel. You know, Cain kills his brother. When does this happen? Right after the sacrifice. Mm-hmm. You know, they get back into their familiar environment, into the field after bringing a sacrifice. So it's like this. They'll come to church together. They'll bring their sacrifice to church together. Yeah, They'll sit beside each other. They'll sing together in church. They'll come to the altar together in church. But when they leave the sacrifice and they go back to the field, that's when the true condition of their heart and their relationship is revealed. Mm -hmm. And he kills his brother, and as a result, the Lord comes to him, and uh, he tells him that from this day forward, the ground will not yield its strength. And this is a, a strong statement because Cain, by trade, by skill, He's a worker of the field. I mean, this is where he, this is his arena of expertise. Yeah. And now God says, because of what you've done to your brother, this ground's not going to give you harvest like it should. And you, Cain, will be a fugitive and a vagabond. What he's saying is you have no right of dominion in the land. Mm. How you treated your brother forfeited your dominion and your harvest in this land. And I think uh, the older I get and, and the more I travel, again, <laughs> It seems so simple because 10 years ago, I would have told you, you know, the biggest obstacle to revival is the prince of the city and, and you know, the devil and, and one third of the angels. And I'm not, those are all real things. But I really think, I really think one of the greatest hindrances to the growth that we have preached about and heard prophesied about is our ability to live in godly relationship one with another. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, the Lord... Uh, repeatedly talks about unity, and I pray that they will be one as we are one, and then the world will know, I think, are the next mm-hmm. words out of his mouth. Um, so there's a witness to the world around us by a relationship one with another. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the case of Cain and Abel, it was the harvest that was impacted by us slandering and killing our uh, well, his brother. Right. So the harvest is impacted. That's powerful. If you look at it, too, uh, you know, Jesus said, by love— they will know that you are my disciples, right. not by power, yeah. not by miracles, by love. And even going back to COVID and the reality of what's happened in the world in the past two years, the conflict with Russia and Ukraine and ethnic division that ha- has swept through uh, cities of, of America especially, but certainly other places as well. What answers all of these problems? Mm. Love. Yeah. Our ability to love one another. But how can we love those we don't know if we don't first love those we do know? Right. And so, again, it, it sounds so simple, but I think the outflow of actually walking with God is you take on, like he gave Adam, his image and his likeness. Mm-hmm. So both in attitude and behavior, I would say, we begin to take on the nature and the character of God, and we exhibit that to those that we walk with in the world. Yeah. And I think if, if we could get... If you could get a group of people who are willing to abandon everything in pursuit of actually walking with God and loving people and be, and sometimes that means having hard conversations. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that means, you know, you, you have awkward conversations because you're prioritizing because love is your motive. You're prioritizing restoration. You're prioritizing reconciliation. You're prioritizing forgiveness. And so, that doesn't mean it's always going to be easy. Matthew 18. Yeah. Yeah. But I think if you could get a group of people that would commit above all to walk with God and walk with each other, yeah, you will see a growing church. That's powerful. By this shall men know that you are my disciples, your love one for another. There's a witness in the world uh, by a relationship one with another. That's powerful. Um, I do I do want to, this will probably be our last question. I'll probably also give you the last word and... Um, the last voice that everyone hears today will be yours. But I do want to touch on, you know, you've already in, in very powerfully uh, unpacked the need for a relationship with God just for, well, with no purpose, that, that just the relational aspect of it. But, of course, 
the qualifier to that, and you've already made the qualifier, is it's not that we shouldn't pray about needs. It's not that we shouldn't, you know, uh, pray about things that are pertinent in our life and in our world. Um, I am curious your thoughts on this, though. You mentioned uh, the conflict in Ukraine at, at the time of this recording. It's hard to know where things will be when this episode is released, but it is late March, and of course the conflict has been raging for three weeks, give or take. Um, there's a lot of issues in our world, as you just alluded to. There are sicknesses and needs in our church family. And, and, and it just sometimes feels like we can be inundated with problems and issues and things that need prayer. But, you know, as a, I don't know that our human brains are, are created to process so much all mm-hmm. the time. So, so sometimes it can, it can feel like you're drowning in the chaos and, and, and it's like, well, what do I pray for? How can I effectively pray for all of these different things? Um, you know, so, uh, how have you, uh, in your walk with God and praying for needs and, and situations, how have you learned to hone in, um, and, and just engage in, in that intercessory prayer properly and not get overwhelmed by, by all of the stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a, gr- a good way to frame the question, but that's what I'm going with. No, I got it. <laughs> I think on a practical side, uh, I just had this conversation with an elder recently and he said, you know, you take a piece of paper, you draw a line down the middle on one side, you write things I can't change. And on the other side, you write things I can change. He said, anything that's bothering you or you feel like you need to address or it goes in one or two columns. If it goes in the things I can't change column, that's the pray about column. Mm-hmm. If it goes in the things I can change. That's the action column. And so for many things, especially if we're talking about uh, things of global size, like a pandemic or, or a war, uh, those are things that by virtue of the media really weigh on our mind because, you know, these phones, as, as great as they are, it's given us the ability to consume uh, a volume of information and, and at a speed that we're simply really not created for. Yeah. And so that can become overwhelming. And so most of those major things would end up on that. The, the, the side of, I can't do anything about this. Mm-hmm. I, this needs to be a matter of prayer. Now, in some context, just to show the difference, uh, there are people right now in Poland, Romania, working with Compassion Services International. So when they do their list, by virtue of how they serve through that ministry, they ha- this goes in the things I can do. Yeah. But for most of us here in Fredericton, now we can participate by giving, by sure. donating. But for most of us, it's not an action thing. It's going to be a prayer thing. And so when it comes to prayer, there's a couple of things. The first I would say is don't minimize the power of uh, making mention. I think it was Paul who wrote and said, I make mention of you in my prayers. Mm. So don't feel like you have to make everything a 20-minute a segment, a, a twenty minute prayer, or everything has to be, you know, I got to intercede for an hour about this. Again, I'm not minimizing those extended times of prayer, uh, but I'm simply saying that we can't do that with everything. Mm-hmm. That's just the reality. And so just because you can't do that with everything doesn't mean you shouldn't make mention of anything. That's very so good. So don't overlook the power of making mention of things in your prayers. Of, of It could be a, as you're driving down the road or at the dinner table when you're praying for your food or before you put the kids to bed or as you're sitting there having a coffee. You're making mention of these things. You're asking God because the psalmist said, the Lord will perfect or complete that which concerneth me. And so to me, by making mention of those things, you're telling God, I'm concerned with this. Mm -hmm. I'm troubled with this because the Lord does nothing but by the avenue of prayer. Yeah. And so when we're troubled, when we're concerned, when we're overwhelmed, to me, God gave us these emotional triggers as an alert that if we will turn to the spirit, God will use our thoughts, our voice, our, our will, our lives as an avenue through which he can access the world. Through our prayer, he will access problems and situations, and he'll begin to perfect or complete. He'll work in those. Now, complete ultimately means that he works them according to his will or his purpose. Mm -hmm. And this is where we have to be willing to surrender our ideas and our desires, because ultimately, God determines what that completeness looks like. And that looks like his will, which I think is what really Paul is getting at in Romans 8. And when he's talking about the spirit of intercession, 
He says, when we don't know what we should pray, the Spirit itself maketh intercession. So when you are interceding, you are praying in the Spirit. It's not your thoughts. It's not your words. It's the Spirit itself. And he goes on to say that it's doing this according to the will of God. Mm. And so when you are praying in the Spirit, you can be certain that you are always praying the perfect will of God. And to me, the beauty of praying in the Spirit is Isaiah said that this is the rest. And so while you are simultaneously praying the perfect will of God, there is a rest in the Spirit. So, for example, if, I, if I'm praying through my, my carnal mind or my natural mind, then what happens is while I'm simultaneously asking God to work, I am emotionally and logically confronted with the reality of that situation. Mm-hmm. It weighs on my mind. It weighs on my emotions. But if I will, uh, if I will push past the flesh, and I will uh, enter into the Spirit, and I'll begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, then in that place, what happens is the Spirit starts thinking for me. The mm. Spirit is speaking for me. The Spirit is praying the perfect will of God. And because it's not my thoughts that are engaged with that, it's not my will or my words, I've surrendered all that to allow the Spirit to work, then I don't carry that same burden. Now, many times when the Spirit of intercession is is moving through you, it can feel very forceful, it can feel intense, Uh, you know, it can feel like, you know, there's like a fire in your belly or something like that, but the, the mental or emotional burden or engagement isn't as heavy because the Scripture promises there's a rest in the Spirit. That's powerful. And so I think a combination of both. Mm-hmm. Don't overlook making mention of those things uh, because God will perfect that which concerneth me. But at the same time, knowing that when the Spirit draws you or you feel the Spirit move upon you, you need to yield and go into that intercession because that's God saying, I want to work with you. I want to work through you to accomplish my will. And the beauty of that is you can simultaneously partner together with God, allow his spirit to speak through you, but there's also a refreshing and a rest for yourself. Jude said, speaking of praying in the Holy Spirit, he said it builds up your most holy faith, keeping yourselves in the love of God. And so the beauty of intercession is, well, it simultaneously allows God to work supernaturally in the world. It's not limited by time, space, culture. Governments can't keep the power of intercession out of their borders. Mm. I mean, it works. Yeah, it works. Well, it simultaneously works. It brings you the refreshing you need and the relief from all the the bombardment of negativity and media that can overwhelm us. That is that is so good. You know, I think that sometimes the enemy will use that sense of being overwhelmed to just keep us silent. Well, I can't pray about all of it, you know, so should I pray about any of it? I, you know, sometimes we think funny things, um, but, but that's powerful, the power of making mention. And, of course, uh, you know, you, you can't pray amiss when you're praying in the Spirit. Right. You're praying the will of God. Well, we've had a great time today. Uh, man, thank you so much for your time. I do want to give you the last word, so I'll just ask you if you want to leave us with a final challenge or an encouragement I release you to do it, but before you do, again, thank you so much for taking time and joining the conversation. Thank you. It has been an honor to be on here. I would say two things, you know, in light of my personal story and being able to share a piece of my testimony, I would speak to anyone today who who is listening and is not uh, serving the Lord. And I would tell you that if you would make the decision to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, that the power of that decision would open a world of possibilities that you could never dream of. If you would have told me on that Sunday morning that I would have the opportunity to be a part of of the kingdom of God and experience the things I have in the past 15 years, I could never have believed it. And so if you're listening today and you are not serving Jesus Christ above all, I invite you to, to visit this great church if you're here in Fredericton or to find a great uh, Pentecostal church in your city, a United Pentecostal church, and experience what God can do for you. And to everybody else who's listening, I'm sure many of us are are, are, are believers, are great saints. I would say this. It's become a life verse for me, Matthew 6 and 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Uh, Refuse to live in the fear of 
of stuff uh, on the uncertainty of, of provision and materialism. And I would challenge you to surrender everything uh, through the filter of the kingdom and to find an avenue of, while I have spoken of the necessity of relationship, I would challenge all of us to find an avenue of kingdom service, to identify the area that God is calling us to be involved, uh, whether that's in your local church or if it's overseas, identify where God is directing you and speaking to you to serve. And no matter the cost, give yourself to it. Pursue the will of God at any cost. Thanks again for tuning in to The Conversation. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to rate and review this podcast, share this episode with a friend, and subscribe for future content. This podcast is produced by Capital Community Church in Fredericton, New Brunswick. If you're in the area, we would love to have you for one of our weekly services. For service times and more information, please check out capitalcommunity.ca. We look forward to seeing you again next month on The Conversation.